This we pray with, with our whole hearts. I hope that these words sound familiar to you. We say them at the end of every prayer in this temple, and in particular at the end of the prayer for world peace, which we recite at almost every Dharma service. When I first came to this temple 11 years ago, I was surprised to hear the word prayer. I was already a Buddhist, but the word prayer wasn't used in the Sangha where I had previously practiced. Rather, we would speak of setting our intentions for a desired outcome, adding the words for the highest good of all at the end of the statement of our intention. The word prayer evoked early memories of my childhood in the Christian church, some of them pleasant and nurturing, but most of them confusing and frustrating. My first experience with prayer was learning my childhood prayer in Swedish from, from my father. I can say it to this day, even though it rarely crosses my mind, and I stopped saying it nightly when I was about eight years old. Later, I was taught that the Lord's Prayer, which contains the line, Thy will be done, is the perfect prayer taught by Jesus to his disciples. To my mind, if I was simply praying that God's will be achieved, why did I need to pray at all? When I prayed, it seemed that sometimes the outcome I prayed for actually came to pass, but other times the very opposite outcome resulted. It didn't seem to me that my prayer had anything to do with my, what might happen. And certainly there were circumstances such as the death of my grandmother, which was clearly inevitable, where prayer for her recovery was futile. Of course, I should have simply prayed for her peaceful transition, but I didn't have this understanding at that time. I struggled on with prayer as I struggled with most every other aspect of my religious upbringing, mostly from a sense of obligation and with the feeling that I was somehow lacking in faith, discipline, and worthiness. Somewhere in my teens, I first encountered the prayer of St. Francis. As with many positive things in my life, it came to me in musical form, since there are countless choral settings of the beautiful verses. The opening lines are these. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. It strikes me now that there is a close parallel with our prayer for world peace, don't you think? At a time in my life when I was questioning the nature and value of prayer, the opening line, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, gave me a deeper understanding of what prayer could achieve and the role I could play in it. Your peace certainly still referred to God's will, but as an instrument, I could take an active part in carrying out God's plan. So now as a Buddhist, what does prayer mean to me? Is it in fact the same as the setting of an intention? as I practiced in my former Sangha? What power or force exactly am I praying to? What do I expect to happen as a result of my prayer? What is appropriate or not appropriate to pray for? How long do I need to iterate a prayer? This series of Dharma talks for the next few months will focus on verses from the doctrine section of the One Buddhist Scripture. In that chapter, chapter 2, is this verse, one of the disciples asked about the principle by which a response comes from silent declaration. The founding master answered, as for the response that comes from silent declaration, the person making it gains an unimaginable power in a natural and spontaneous manner, which is in accordance with that person's sincerity. Bear in mind, however, that the great response and awesome power will ultimately appear only when one continuously and wholeheartedly carries out one's vow without violating any vows already made. You must especially keep this point in mind. If in this manner you gain firm power of mind, you will even be able to seize infinite heavenly authority and display awesome power that is like that of heaven and earth. In this passage, silent declaration refers to prayer, and response is what we might call the answer to prayer. I have to admit that in reading through this chapter to choose a verse for today's talk, I was first struck by the last sentence, if in this manner you gain firm power of mind, you will even be able to seize 
infinite heavenly authority and display awesome power that is like that of heaven and earth. Heavenly authority? Awesome power? Sign me up. (laughs) Of course I say that jokingly, and I've never been tempted by any sort of even earthly power. But isn't there that hidden part of our ego that wants, even if only a little, to be recognized for our wisdom, our competence, our abilities? Aren't we generally happier if we feel that we can use those competencies and insight to give us more control over our circumstances? In what Buddhists sometimes call auspicious coincidence, just as I was mulling this passage, I received the gift of a book written by a Tibetan Lama, Sakyong Rinpoche, called Ruling Your World. Heavenly authority, ruling my world. Hmm. I immediately read the book from cover to cover. Of course, it has nothing to do with wielding power and authority in the concrete sense of rule. Truthfully, I think I already knew what I would find in this book. Ruling one's world does not imply gaining power in the world. Rather, it means to live one's life in harmony and at peace with the way things are, to know and control one's mind, and to understand the truth of the principles of harm and grace, cause and effect. Is this also what Sotasan means by heavenly authority, awesome power like that of heaven and earth? Let's consider the words of Yongju, prayer chant that we chant at each Dharma service, and which we chanted this morning, of course. Line one. The spiritual energy of heaven and earth settles in my being. The energy of heaven and earth is the way, the truth embodied in Dharmakaya Buddha, Ilwan. The first step of prayer is to empty ourselves of ego, of judgment and preconceptions, and to allow the truth to settle in its place. Line two, my spirit penetrates all things as my mind wills. If I am aligned with truth, if it has truly settled in my being, my mind will be one with truth. In this way, my spirit is aligned with reality and can discern the operation of cause and effect, harm and grace in all things. Line three, heaven, earth, and I become one. I'm beyond duality, judgment, attachment, seeking recognition. I accept the truth of existence without struggle. Line four, I am one with the way of heaven and earth. I become truth itself. Whatever I think, say, or do is the manifestation of truth, reflects the truth, and does not contradict the truth. How do we know if indeed we are of one mind with the truth, so that our intentions, our prayers, reflect only that truth? Here are some possible guidelines to test the motives for our thoughts, prayers, and intentions. Do I feel at peace with my prayer? Can I maintain a sense of equanimity in the presence of sensory conditions that may cause me to doubt? Do I see evidence of wisdom and insight in what I am asking for? Is my prayer grounded in compassion? Is its intent to benefit others? At this point, I'm peeling back the layers of of an onion. First layer, I realize that the act of prayer means aligning myself with the truth. Second layer, I've established some guidelines for myself to test the motives for my prayer. The next layer seems to be to find out how to know if I've actually come into alignment with the truth, that I am at one with the way of heaven and earth. How can I discern if my prayers are aligned with truth? First, I must accept the law of cause and effect, the working out of karma in both the immediate and long term. Understand that I cannot always know what causes are at work in in any given situation. Therefore, my understanding may be limited, and I may have to confine my prayer to simply affirming grace. I also must acknowledge the truth of both suffering, as the Buddha perceived it, and grace, as Sotasan chose to emphasize. Although a certain situation may seem to express only suffering, my prayers and intentions for its resolution 
must try to find an aspect of harm, of grace from harm. Accepting the truth of suffering, of change and impermanence, of death, I can learn to live beyond hope and fear, to live in the world as it is, not as I wish it to be. I can understand this truth without continual reference to me, which gives me the confidence arising from equanimity. If I can achieve these things, I am brought into the working out of the way, allowing grace to arise from harm or harm from grace, as we recite in the Il Wan Sang vow. I become that instrument that St. Francis referred to in his prayer, the instrument of God's peace, or in more one Buddhist terms, the instrument of grace. I am no longer struggling against reality, the truth of existence. When this happens, I may feel that auspicious coincidences begin to happen. By training my mind in these truths, my mind opens to the vast potential contained in every situation. I see the signs of what is and what can be because I am open to them. Wisdom and compassion attune me to life and the environment responds. This is the wind beneath the wings of prayer, that awesome power to which Sotasan refers. This, it seems to me, is the answer to prayer. One layer remains, the question of how long to pray. In many religions, there are adherents who devote themselves to a life of prayer. Since the early days of Christianity and continuing until the present, there have been orders of nuns and monks whose sole duty was to intercede for humanity through constant prayer. Perpetual prayer is also followed by certain paths of Judaism, Islam, and Hinduism. The Church of Christian Science teaches that prayer is meant to lead to an understanding of God and the nature of the underlying spiritual creation. Are you hearing the echoes of Yongju here? Christian scientists believe that prayer does not change the spiritual aspect of creation, but rather gives a clearer view of it. And the result appears in the human scene as healing. Human reality adjusts to coincide more nearly with divine reality. Here is a quotation from the Christian context attributed to psychologist William McGill. The value of persistent prayer is not that God will hear us, but that we will finally hear God. In other words, we will understand the truth. Do you remember what Sotasan said in the Dharma passage we read earlier? The great response and awesome power will ultimately appear only when one continuously and wholeheartedly carries out one's vow. So, we can be in a constant state of prayer in which we continually strive to align ourselves with the truth of what is. If there is no immediate object of prayer that comes to our minds, we can simply express gratitude to the way of heaven and earth. The 13th century German theologian Meister Eckhart said, if the only prayer you ever say in your whole life is thank you, that would suffice. I think the great baseball pitcher Satchel Paige said it best, and it's particularly appropriate for the weather this morning. Don't pray when it rains if you don't pray when the sun shines. Mm -hmm.